one. Hello, everyone. So this is YMP TV on episode eight now, and we have Ross BT, chairman of Pan American Silver and Equinox Gold. Hi, Ross. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure, Bianca. So I'll ask you a few questions and you give us your thoughts. Um, we'll, we'll start from the beginning. Like, how is COVID-19 impacting Pan American Silver and, and Equinox Gold? Well, you know, like, like everything, uh, it's a very profound impact. It's, uh, it's impacting everything and everyone right now. It's quite incredible. In my lifetime, I've never seen, nobody has ever seen anything like this. Uh, it's certainly the most profound dislocation since uh, the Second World War, I would say, as a global event. Uh, it will end at some point, but it's really having a huge impact today on everything, everybody, everywhere. Uh, in terms of mines, we had to, in Pan American Silver, we now have, uh, I think, 11 mines in the Americas. We've now closed everyone but our two Canadian mines, funnily enough. <laughs> In Timmins, we have two operations there, and they're both running. But every other one is closed in Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, and Mexico. Uh, and uh, our big development projects in Argentina and, uh, and Guatemala, especially, that we're hoping to get going uh, sometime this year, they're completely paralyzed because, uh, you know, you can't move in those countries. So it's very profound. And from a personal level, uh, every one of our employees is very profoundly impacted also because even though we still have everyone on the payroll today, we're keeping everybody employed at least. Uh, providing lots of uh, support for their families and the communities do what we can there. It's still hard to, to live when you have to be confined in, in this self uh, uh, quarantine or isolation situation. And it's, so it's very odd, very strange for everybody. And with the policy measures being taken by government, whether it's like quantitative easing, lowering interest rate, do you think we'll see an increase in the demand for gold and an increase in gold prices? And if so, where do you see the price of gold going in the next month or the next year? Well, I could take an hour and answer that question, but I, but I won't. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be very brief. I mean, quite frankly, uh, gold has been in a secular uptrend or bull market since 1916, uh, 2016. It's, uh, it's now the fourth year, really, uh, that has been going. It, it bottomed at 1050 back in, uh, back in January of 2016, and it's, it's, it's had a pretty good run so far. So we're in a bull run anyway, and I was predicting higher prices anyway. But this has just put rocket fuel on that prediction. It's, uh, it's the extent to which governments are, are, uh, are easing, are trying to juice their economies to get things back and get e economic growth back on track. And it's just, they're printing so much money there. They've just stopped all the traditional rules of, of discipline and they're all kind of demeaning or devaluing the, the value of paper currencies as much as they possibly can. It's a tradition. It's a, it's a model, model that's worked. It, it'll get the economy going, but it'll create inflation ultimately, and it will reduce the value of paper currencies. This is always good for gold. It's been good for gold for hundreds and thousands of years, in fact. So it's a tendency of governments to do this, and, uh, and gold is, is absolutely going to go higher. I wouldn't be surprised right now in this environment to see gold way over $2,000 an ounce. I mean, really, it, it's, it's, it's going to have a profound impact, in my view. Uh, and, uh, and so anybody with gold in their, in their company's uh, assets or production is, is going to do well. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same for many other metals, and especially the oil space uh, or the coal space, which I think are doomed really maybe for, for the rest of my lifetime. And with the current crisis, we're seeing mines and refiners shutting down. What is the outlook for the supply and demand of, of met precious metals? Yeah, so for, for silver, it's more important when you, when you lose the supply chain and, and especially the industrial demand uh, is reduced for, for silver because silver is, of course, an industrial and a precious metal. But looking at gold specifically, you know, the, the effect of closures of mines uh, really doesn't have anything to do with the gold market. The, the annual world gold mine supply is, is almost, not entirely, but almost irrelevant to the price of gold. The price of gold is set by investment demand, and there's so much above ground gold that uh, it could or could not come into the market, depending on whether it's mobilized for sale or held for uh, not for sale, that uh, the extra marginal amount that comes into the mining industry isn't that significant. You could shut down the whole global mining industry, and it, 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 it doesn't account for more than a few percent of, of, uh, of, uh, of 
gold reserves in the world that are liquid and able to be sold. Uh, most of those are in central banks and, and in people's uh, underneath people's pillows and mattresses. Uh, if they choose, or, or in jewelry, if they choose to sell it, the gold price is going to be uh, uh, terrible. Uh, if they choose to, to, to buy more and to, to keep it as a store of value, the gold price is going to go up. Uh, mining doesn't really have much of an impact. On the other hand, for you know copper or the base metals or, or most other metals, if you, if you lose that mine supply, you will impact the, uh, the price. The price should stay higher because, of course, mo mostly, most commodities follow most normal economic rules of, of demand and supply. If, you, if the demand, demand goes, goes down, the price goes down. If the, if the supply goes down, the price goes up. That's how things work usually. Not so for gold. And with the current crisis of COVID-19, what do you think will be the impact on exploration financing? Yeah, it's, it's going to impact it for sure. It, it's, it's impacting everything, really everything. Supply of capital is, is one of the things that will impact uh, people's ability to uh, take risks. Um, people's, uh, you know, most exploration financing is, is, uh, is money people can afford to lose. It, it's, it's what they should invest, at least, they, the money they can afford to lose. So it's speculative money. And if people are constrained because the economy is weak, People need the money for mortgages and for food and for their families. They just don't have that money to spend. If they've suffered big investment losses, they don't have that money to spend. And that's why bear markets tend to beget bear markets and bull markets create bull markets. These things follow these cycles for this reason. If you lose a lot of money in the market, you don't have that money to reinvest. This and a piece of that money that people have to invest goes into speculative investing. So I do think that for a while, you're going to see quite a drop in speculative investment, which will reduce the funding for exploration companies, with the one exception possibly being gold, because, because if gold moves up, as I expect it will this, will, this will make any company with gold in its name a sought after uh, investment product, whether it be the mining companies or down the market, the juniors. And so you know, with, with that one exception, gold and possibly silver, uh, I do see less expiration funding, but if there is a gold run the way we're seeing right now, you're seeing lots of financings this week, in fact, and I don't expect that to, to decrease. Do you think we'll see more M&A and consolidation in the market in the months and probably the year to come? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say, to be honest, Bianca. I mean, it, these deals are hard to do. You know, we've, mm -hmm. you know, I've been involved in a couple in the last two years. Uh, Equinox bought Leo Gold to, to form a bigger company. That was an absolute home run. Uh, it made a lot of money for investors. It was a sensible deal. Uh, one and one really truly in that case was three. Similarly, Pan American bought Tahoe a couple of years ago. Once again, uh, a smart deal, very, very well timed and, and really one of these logical mergers. So it, it, again, all shareholders did well out of that, that deal. And, and, and so if you can get the deal right, it, it, it's a great thing to do because the market today really favors scale. It favors size. People want liquid, large investments. It brings new pools of capital to, to invest uh, in these companies. And generally speaking, it causes share prices to rise and it's good business to do this, uh, to, to put companies together and build larger companies that are less risky, have more, have more diversification, and generally uh, offer better risk-reward opportunities for investors. So that's the larger companies, but they're hard to do. You have to, get the, you have to get the right ones. There's been lots of examples of dumb mergers that have no synergies, that are, that are just growth for the sake of growth, and, and nobody wants to have those kind of deals. Uh, you also have to deal with all the social issues when you put companies together, and it's hard to twist management's arms to join into another company where they lose their name. It's a, it's a natural thing to want to kind of hold on to the companies that you, you're involved with. You know, CEOs are, there's only room for one CEO if you bring two companies together. And so you have to have this, this management merger that, that is really hard to do. So the social issues in these deals are, are just as, as hard to, to figure out as the, as the operational or the, or the financial issues involved. They're hard to do. There's, there's, if they're done right, they're, they're good, and there is a tendency towards uh, the market wanting larger companies. So that should drive more M&A opportunities. But again, there's so few logical ones. I don't see a huge amount coming. And then as you go down market into the smaller companies, it's always smart to, to try to, to, to get scale and to try to deliver to investors what they want these days, which is bigger companies. 
But uh, you know, you always have quite unique opinions of value. What people think, you know, their companies are worth versus the other company that they're looking at joining with, and you know, people always feel their own stuff is better and they're always cheaper. The, the, the market always values them less than what they're really valued at. So it's hard to bring these companies together and hard to have synchronicity on, on value expectations. And, um, and so you'll see some, they're hard to do. Uh, and for the speculative companies, quite frankly, since there's so much that, that, is, that rides on a, new, uh, you know, a couple of good drill holes and, and luck in, in the business, and, because of that, you know, people are loath to give up that 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 luck uh, bet, and and really for investors, that's kind of what they're buying when they're buying these exploration speculations. They're betting on kind of like a casino. They're just they're just rolling the dice. Well, when you have two companies that have the same kind of risk uh, envelope, uh, you'd better have the same reward envelope because then you have this you have a, a logical you know a logical condition for bringing the companies together but that's really rare everybody has different views of what what they think could come out of a successful exploration program and uh, they would prefer simply to just roll the dice drill the holes see what they get if they get good holes the stock could go up five times and that's what rewards them for taking that speculative bet uh, you don't get that when you combine companies in the exploration game you lose that so you've been through a couple of like I guess a crisis or down cycle throughout your career. How did you manage to go through them as a mining executive and as a mining investor? Yeah. Um, well, I've I've lived through lots of bear markets in my career for sure, uh, and bull markets. I mean, cycle. It's a cyclical business, and uh, this is just another one of those cycles. It's extremely profound. It's extremely rapid. It's deep, and it's it's just been uh, been a, a true black swan uh, of a negative nature, but but it's definitely not the only one. There was the big financial crisis. There was a dot com blow up. There was, you know, the, the the bear market in gold that really went from and, and most metals actually from from 1996 or 1997 right until 2002. Very beat up markets. Terrible. If you were in the copper business or zinc business or or even gold and silver, you know, gold went down to to less than three hundred dollars an ounce and and copper to, to 60 cents a pound. You know, these were prices that are just, are just unheard of today even. So, you know, things were actually quite a bit worse then, and they lasted a lot longer because this particular time, I think like in 2009, you're going to see a nice little rebound when things get back to normal. And it's gonna be driven by all of this easing, all of this money that's being poured into the world economic systems by governments. It's going to bring infrastructure programs back, that'll use metals. It's gonna get people buying things again, that'll use metals. China's kinda of gonna come back and they're still driving a, to, to a bigger, stronger economy. Um, all of this will use metals again. However, the, the value of the metals in, in, in kind of purchasing power basis, the, the, the price of the metals will go up, the value won't go up because the value of all money is going to go down as we, I think we're gonna reinflate at some point in the next uh, year or two and that's going to reduce the value the buying, the purchasing power of, of, of money. Um, so I guess just, just to sort of sum up, um, I have lived through lots of these crises. I see them very much as opportunities to invest, opportunities to put companies together, try to take advantage of, of you know, being in strong financial shape to buy or acquire weaker companies. I've made a lot of money in taking advantage of these weak markets in previous cycles. Uh, this is when I started my copper business, the Lumina Copper Group back in 2020, uh, 2002, I should say. Uh, I began Pan American Silver in the early 90s when silver was on the, on the floor. Uh, we started our gold business a few years ago when gold prices were low. And I just, I mean, this is, this is a fabulous time to really start things out, put companies together um, or put assets together um, and, build things for when things get better. This is a cyclical business where the mining business is, is, is cycles. It's, that's never gonna end. And right now the cycle is on the bottom. It's a great time to be accumulating, to be buying, not to be fearing, not to be, don't forget that you know, the Chinese character for danger is the same as the Chinese character for opportunity. So seek opportunity where others see fear. Uh, and 
the world's going to need metals forever. You have to pick the right ones to some degree. Uh, but uh, I see copper bouncing back. I, I think uh, certainly gold and silver are strong. Uh, other metals in different ways, uh, nickel, sort of 50-50, zinc kind of 50-50, lead 50-50. But, but, uh, but many opportunities will improve and be, be, be good for people. So I, this is the time to really go in and, and go in hard. And do you think like the mining industry and mining companies will operate differently in a post COVID world? Not really. I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think anybody will operate differently. Everybody says, well, this, this is going to change everything. And I, I don't buy that. I mean, I think people's, people's uh, tendencies are, are kind of, you know, fairly, uh, fairly objective. They, they don't really change that much. We're greedy. We lust, we fear, we do all these, these human condition things. And, and I just don't see this event particularly changing how we behave. It's going to change the economy to some degree because supply chains have to get restored. Um, uh, the government's flooding the market with money right now. That's going to filter through the economy in a rather extraordinary way. That's not normal, but it's going to drive demand for sure. And it's going to drive economic growth. It's going to kind of get things going again. But, but people are going to spend too much and uh, consume too much and, 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 and wreck, the, wreck, the, wreck nature as they've been doing for you know, for decades and decades, and uh, I, I don't see that changing too much. The only constraint on this, to some degree, I think, is is going to be climate change. To be honest, if if people really understand the science behind climate change, they should change their behavior and they should change how they live, how they eat, uh, what they do, how they consume. They're doing this in some degree in in Europe. They're doing it to some degree in Canada, less so in the U.S., but not not at all they're doing it to some degree in Asia. And this means, this, this is going to mean quite a significant change in things, more so than the COVID uh, crisis. I really don't see that affecting too many things on a long-term basis. But if people get serious about climate change the way they should, because it's a truly existential issue for, for, for humans all over the world when we have global warming and acidification of our oceans and massive disruption to immigration patterns and, 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 and how people live and, and how their health and, and, and uh, you know, many, many profound things having to do with the underpinnings of human existence. Uh, if they get to that realization and if they change their behavior, that, that's going to have a profound impact. It's going to, you know, how, how we generate electricity, how we drive, uh, whether we drive and, and all kinds of things. It's going to change how cities are, how, how, how agriculture is done, you know, that will be a profound change looking out over the next five or 10 years. And people should think about that and get ready for that. And you founded a number of companies and created billions of dollars in shareholders value since the 1990s. <laughs> You've also built Pan American Silver into one of the largest silver producer with 11 miles, 11 mines, sorry, in Latin America and Equinox Gold, which has six mines. Can you tell us what are the elements that makes um, a mining company successful? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see, in, in one minute or in one hour? I, mean, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I can't, you know, I've never written about this. I've never, I don't have any kind of quick, uh, quick recommendations. It's, it's just, how can I say, um, putting your head down, uh, being focused, working with great people around you, uh, having a common mission that's easy to explain to investors, and just going for it, you know, um, give her, you know, that, that's kind of what's worked for me. Um, Pan American was a pretty simple concept uh, to build the world's largest silver mining company when we had nothing, no assets, no, no, no money, no, no nothing <laughs> back in uh, early, uh, back in the 90s, the 1994 specifically. And, and yet we did it. Uh, we were tenacious. We were focused. We were all on the same page. Our investors loved the mission. They, they got behind us. They financed us. In good times and in bad times, and then uh, with the copper story, it was just putting a whole bunch of copper companies together, copper assets when the copper price was low, and and when the copper price went up, you know, basically exploring them and 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 selling them to companies that wanted big copper deals. And on the gold side, now with Equinox, it's it's again, it's a pretty simple mission to build a really really big gold company because I think that's what investors want now. And the bigger we are, the more exposure we have to gold. And if gold goes up, the bigger you are, the more you benefit from that. So it's a, it's a pretty simple story, uh, and uh, and and it's just a matter of putting your head down and doing it. I, I'm really surprised that more people don't 
don't do it because it, it doesn't seem that complicated to me. Um, so I don't think that's going to change too much going forward. And I think for anybody who really has big ambitions, the way, you know, for some weird, peculiar reason I, I've always had, I mean, that's maybe the ingredient that's, that's the most strange is, is asking why that is. I can't answer that easily myself. But, you know, for people like me, uh, there's always going to be opportunities to to build companies and uh, and make big discoveries and it's a risky business but if you keep persevering at it and if you if you do what you say you're going to do investors will, will believe you and, and and give you money again and again and and it, they're very forgiving if you have failure as long as you uh, are honest to them and and uh, and and spend the money as you as you say you're going to um, keep the story simple keep it focused uh, don't you know, try to work the cycles right so that if it's a, a down cycle, you're preserving your own capital and you're using joint ventures. If it's an up cycle, you're, you're financing to strong markets. Equity cost of capital is very important. Uh, otherwise, you know, luck is a massive part of this whole thing. And it's been, a, it's been the one thing I've been able to rely on in my career is, is being very lucky. And so, the, you know, long live it. But, but uh, a little bit of preparation also favors, favors luck. So, Ross, what advice would you give to a young professionals starting their career in this period and also to do those who are considering joining the industry but are maybe hesitant seeing how the market is yeah it's a great industry it's uh, it's an industry that is a lot of fun international travel and uh, excitement and for people like me who have always been rather impatient and and uh, I love to travel I love to meet new people and 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 get all over the place and and have new experiences, it's been a fantastic uh, career. Uh, it's also a place you can make a pretty good buck if you uh, work hard and, and things go your way. Uh, so I encourage it to, to anybody who's enthusiastic and, uh, and wants to kind of get out and see the world. It's an international business. Uh, it's good when you're young to have these opportunities because uh, it, it kind of almost favors young people, um, particularly now. There's not that many in the business, and I think it's a great business to, to get into if you're in this great career opportunities. The world will always need mines. It's, uh, it's an industry that's one of these basic industries that, um, you know, if you can't grow it, you have to mine it. So it's, 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 uh, it's always going to be needed, uh, maybe not in the same amounts as we are mining today. If we have a chance to have a more sustainable world, we have to reduce our demand of most metals. So things are going to change in the future, but there will always be an industry. And so there will always be good, well-paying jobs and good opportunities for young people. Um, and if you're uh, kind of one of those small subsets of impatient, jealous, impatient, selfish, greedy people like me, you have an opportunity as an entrepreneur to, to build great companies. And there's not many businesses that you can do it as, as easily as you can in the mining business because it really is an industry that favors entrepreneurs. And do you have any last piece of advice for investors and including millennials that are members and are watching this? <laughs> you know, I, the advice is it's, I, I really, because this is a cyclical business, uh, you know, times like this are very difficult. I mean, especially if, if you happen to be laid off, if you happen to be not able to finance or not able to, to build things in these markets, you just have to get through it and try to always keep your eye on the ball that is somewhere else where things are going is where you want to play to and if you because things will change things it, it, when things are dark and cloudy and stormy that's always the time when you are most fearful but that's when you should be the most courageous that's when you should be trying to build things for when things get better they will get better they always do and um and by the same token when things are really rosy at the top you should start selling. You should start remembering to take money off the table because things are going to get worse. That's just how the world works in our business. And so right now, I'd say for, for, for young, uh, for young uh, mining professionals is to just get through this time. If you have the opportunity to try to take advantage of it by building value today, uh, do so. Try to, try to exploit other people's um, unfortunate, you know, misfortunes or, or, or lack of, uh, of luck. And, uh, and, and, and acquire good properties. Uh, it, it's, it's really hard for me to, to try to give advice to others from my own career because it just, I don't know, I, 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 
I, I didn't have an advisor. I didn't have a mentor. I just kind of, I just kind of did it, and it, it just kind of all fell into place after lots of mistakes. Believe me, I made I made many, many, many mistakes, and now I'm making different mistakes. So, you know, put your head down, work hard. There's no there's no better recipe than hard work. Stay focused. Stick. Be true to yourself. Try to treat your money like your money. Try to treat your shareholders' money like your money. And you'll come through this and you'll be in strong, in strong shape when things change. They will change. They will get better. Remember that and, and plan for it. Well, thank you, Ross. That's great. That's really good advice and a great interview. I mean, I, I really appreciate you took the time for our members. Um, I have nothing else to do. <laughs> We're all in the same <laughs> I'm boat. Sitting We're all my, at home. I'm growing my, my, COVID, my COVID fuzz. I don't know if you can call it beard. <laughs> No, that's great. And we've decided that so for each interview that I record, which hopefully will continue till the end of the month, and then after that I can go back to work for real. But we've decided that we will make a donation uh, to our, well, as YMP through our mining, initi mining care initiative. And the money will go through uh, United Way Greater Toronto to help those in need during the COVID-19 period, like students Thank or so, so that's what we'll do um and i'll provide a link to our listeners so they know when they get more information perfect thank okay, you then. ross thank so, you very much Bianca. take care i'll stay safe okay see you later <laughs> bye, -bye.